Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Relish and Dead podcast where we devour everything in the TWD universe. I'm Dawn. Welcome to the Lisa. <laughs> Barb. And I'm Carol. So our guest tonight is Lou Temple, but we are waiting on him. He is in travel. So as soon as we can get him logged in, we will jump him on here. <laughs> so in the meantime, you're stuck with us. Yes. Yeah, so if you have any questions for us, just throw them in the comments. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we'll talk some shit tonight. Yes. So, Barb, I was wondering what kind of exciting thing happened to you hmm. this weekend? I got to see you over the weekend. Yay. And your handsome son, Joey. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, we got to go to Huntsville Pop Comic and Pop Culture Con, whatever it's called. Got to see my man Ross. Oh, well, here we go. Yay. Hi. Hi. Hey. 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 Nice to see you. Hi. Thank Hi. you. You know, I've been sitting where I thought I was waiting in the studio and I realized I hadn't really entered the studio. So thank you for um, being patient with me. Oh, okay. no problem. No, Dawn had seen a picture of a uh, that you took out a window at Mount Rainier, and she went, "Oh crap!" He said, "Flying." <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting about me, or it's actually not interesting at all. But um, you're the second person, Dawn, that's uh, that's sleuthed that information. And um, <laughs> somebody called me and asked me where I was, and I said, "Well, I'm at home in Los Angeles." And, they're like, yeah, but we saw a picture from an airplane. I'm like, ah, I, I typically post a week or two late. I'm behind. And I guess um, maybe I do that to let that photo marinate in me that I can <laughs> kind of give it a little more attention than, oh, yeah, I just took this picture. Or maybe it represents the trip. But, yeah, I, I, I never – I think I try to – or I go against – the the grain uh swim upstream on the posting and the immediacy and the here and now of it i'm like oh no i'm not i'll, I'll wait and then it just confuses people mainly especially my parents my parents are always wondering where the hell i'm at or you know, i'll post something from work i did last year i'll be on a movie set from last year and just oh yeah there's this picture of me and danny trejo i'll post that and they'll be like, hey, you and Danny on a film somewhere? I'm like, yeah, last year. And, they're like, yeah. <laughs> and it seems to make sense to me, but it doesn't make sense to anyone else. So I, I, I need to fix that. Does anyone really have a kind of a do's and don'ts as far as posting goes? What, what, it, what are the rules? Post it right away. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't think there are any rules, Lou. You just do you, honey. Yeah, okay. you do you. You break all the you break all the rules already. That's, so that's, maybe uh, keep breaking like them. Each each end of the spectrum. I, yeah. So there's somewhere in between that's that, that that's okay. Um, yeah, I've always uh, I've always waited to post. Um, you know what? It, I know exactly why that is. I'm not really one to post from my phone interestingly ah. so i'm a little antiquated and i'm a little luddite so i will take the pictures off my phone download them onto my laptop um and then pull them off my laptop and maybe even post from my laptop or mm -hmm. at least uh a, a couple of the socials like uh, what used to be twitter is x i do that mm -hmm. off my laptop i do uh tie in a Facebook off my laptop and even LinkedIn. And then Instagram, I don't think you can post off your laptop, right? It, it is. Yeah, you can. Oh, you, you can? can? Oh, you shouldn't, have told, me, you shouldn't yeah. have told me that. Because yeah. <laughs> I was almost getting, you know, um, I'm, I'm strange that way. Uh, technologically, I rely a lot on my laptop. I'm on my phone right now, so. Mm -hmm. We're well, but I used to do this on the laptop, so I'd have to, you know, appropriate it so it, it was all set. But um, the phones pretty much do everything. They're not even phones. They're little devices, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Girls know me best about my pictures. As soon as I get a picture, it's got to go out there so I don't lose it later. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. So um, That's my role. we have uh, 
the, the, the four of you. Is there anyone else that's not being repped on no, that? No, it's just the four of us. But we have a lot of people that are in the audience as yeah. well. So out of the and four of you, quick question, who uses the cloud? The one, one, two, three. Uh, okay. No. Yeah. I don't I have use for the my cloud. job. I, I don't have use for my job. Okay. No, I don't no. use the cloud. I have a hard drive, a backup hard drive. Likewise. And I guess the reason is um, I'm not that conspirator, conspiratorial <laughs> that much, but I do feel like those pictures, once they go out there, everyone else's. And there's, it's not so much my pictures are important or good or secretive, but they're just mine. So yeah, I'm not really, you. and I don't want my pictures getting your pictures germs, you know? <laughs> and so I guess I do that, which, you know, my da my daughter's like, you're an idiot. And, and also, <laughs> so here's some interesting, none of this is what's very interesting at, at all to any of you, but um, there'll be an actor out there who will appreciate this that's watching, maybe Jason Warner Smith, for instance. Uh, he, he would not watch me on this interview. Um, but uh, the thing is, is that on our devices, we use them more than ever because we do these self tapes for auditions. <laughs> and um, those videos that we shoot are uh, turned, turned around and submitted to casting. And so invariably, I will have two or three of these piled up in my um, iMovie mm -hmm. uh, app. And, and it'll just eat up storage on my little device. And um, and so if I use the cloud, for instance, I know that my device would be freed up instead of me then having in the midst of, of doing one of these auditions. And perhaps I'd ask one of y'all to, hey, will you read with me? And then you'd be sitting there waiting for me to, yeah. oh, oh, I can't get rid of that. Oh, no, I got to keep that. Hmm, what a, you know, what a waste of, what a bunch of, who my God. And so I, fi I find that my technology awareness is, you know, respectable, but my behavior is, is old. <laughs> I feel that. I feel it. <laughs> when we first started, and you'll remember this, uh, when we first started, you know, the, the AMC asked us, in fact, somebody could call bullshit on this, but I think that in our contracts, we were, we, we were mandated to get, to get a, twi a social media account, which was specific to Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the marketing department understood, um, and, and we didn't get it at all. I mean, Norman did. Norman seemed to take off and run with it really well. But the rest of us were sort of like, this is silly. And mm -hmm. so we we made fun of it in the beginning. Yeah. And we weren't really aware of what <clears throat> or how uh, behaviorally it was supposed to work. And and it, and it had, it's changed since then. I mean, my God, that's, you know, for me, that's been since 2012, 2011. And so it's changed drastically mm -hmm. behaviorally, uh, yeah. social media. But as you know, in the beginning, uh, the idea was to maintain a little exclusivity so that you, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure why we acted that way, but we did, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was the idea, well, if we follow her, how do you distinguish who you follow? And, uh, so don't follow anyone. And we did that <laughs> for a long time. And, and then all of a sudden, I think that, again, is a very Luddite approach. Now I realize, oh, the more people you follow, the more people follow you. Yeah. It's yeah. symbiotic, right? Um, so. Uh, I, about, I about wrecked the day that I got JDM followed me. I just about wrecked my car. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> and. and did he um, did 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 he make 
you know that he followed you? Did he sh shout out and say, hey, just checking in or anything like that? Or all of a sudden the, you just he has He has made two comments, one about the birthday cake I had and then a comment that I had made to his wife, Hillary. Um, but he's very selective with oh. who he actually interacts with. Uh, but oh. he'll send a thumbs up or a heart or something like that. But when That's I got great. that notice, you know, I had to first go look to see if it was really him. And then when it was, I was just like, oh, my God, I'm going to wet my pants. Um, <laughs> and then the next week, I know Melissa McBride had an account, but she's not very active. And then I got a follow from her official oh. account. And I was like, now I'm really going to pee my pants. And so had you um, had you done something that uh, an activity or that elicited some notice from you? Like, you oh, just, sure. I ain't too proud to beg. Um yeah. <laughs> but I mean, had you been like on a trip and, and somebody's like, hey, this this person's really putting it out there. That's cool. My 50th birthday cake was of ah. Jeffrey Dean Morgan. And, well, and there you go. Him. And then there was a really particular um, hard episode there towards the end with Melissa McBride when she sure. was leading the board. And, and I commented about the character of Carol. It was a pretty big written deal. And she liked it and then followed me. And of course, then that's, that's the last I've ever heard from her. But, um, so I just need to get, you know, there's this Lou Temple guy, but he, Oh, am I not? He's not following, he's not following yeah. any of us. I don't it's think. So, so, uh, and then curiously what, um, because for me, it's very compartmentalized. Um, and this is a, again, old behavior patterns, but, uh, what media is it? What social media is it that you're followed on? And he follows me on Twitter, uh, Twitter. But I don't. I don't use it very often. I'm more of an Instagram and Facebook girl. So Instagram, Facebook is the best yeah, too. Yeah. Y'all yeah. still, yeah, yeah. And this, uh, this show is on Facebook, is it not? Facebook yes. and YouTube. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so how long have you all been up uh, and running? June nineteenth will be a year. <laughs> Oh, congratulations. You're, you're, you're just, you're newbies, newborns yes. you're yes. coming Love up on, on a year. We want and to keep the world going with the, the yeah. walking dead. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. It's, I think that is an interesting uh, task. Uh, I don't think it's a problem because I think uh, what you must be experiencing and I'm getting a little of it, interestingly, is there's, there's starting to become a whole new audience. Yes. Uh, that are starting, yeah. that ha, are finding The Walking Dead yeah. sans the hype, right? Because right. a lot of us got into The Walking Dead in the midst of uh, of the excitement, the the here and now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The Walking Dead was posting in time and, and we right. were part of it, right? But now right. there's there's people just coming around and they're, they're young. They're my daughter's age at 16 because some yeah. of her friends now are like, dude, I just saw your dad on this show that I'm watching. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, um, you're just getting it. And then I realized, of course, because they were, you know, they were four or five years old when that was happening. So there's this whole teenage movement that's landing with it. And they uh -huh. can you think you can stream or did, you know, they they actually can just plow through it very quickly. Right. Right. We have been so blessed and so fortunate to have so many of the the cast members on our podcast. Oh, cool! Um, last night we had Michael Satrazimus, and yeah. yep. last yep. Monday we had your buddy Steve Coulter, who I said to Steve. tell you hello. You know, so yeah, yeah, he's he's fantastic, and he's uh, uh, you know, he's mad talented but multi-talented you know he's a he's a heck of a writer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which i think is is lovely and um and i bet he's a good reader and i only say that because i always send him things that i write and he never reads it <laughs> <laughs> i think out of professional courtesy he's sparing me his uh his red pen mm -hmm. um but uh i i love steve and i think he's really fun and and uh he's he's shown up in such great stuff outside of the walking dead obviously yeah. you know but uh he's he's very diverse too because he could play or he, he can present really uh kind of well done 
mm-hmm. like he did on the show, you know, um, Reg. And, and, but then he also, uh, he can be, uh, you know, rough up a little bit and be a, mm-hmm. a, a malcontent. <laughs> and yeah. he does that really well also. Yeah. We've also so we had Vince Ward and Nick Gomez on the show too. Both of those rascals. Talk about malcontents. Well, uh, <laughs> Maybe not Vincent, but but for sure Nick is a is a is some trash. Yeah, uh, you know Vincent. Uh, I think he just had a birthday. He did just have a birthday, and yeah. um, and he is on a show uh, on BET Plus, I think, called uh, House of Vicious. So he's doing pretty good. Yeah, he's doing well. And then Nick, he just kind of stays busy. He's um, Nick's like a uh, lone wolf, so to speak, but yeah. he, he's good in company, but then he'll drift off and be, uh, be on his own. And then he'll show up on something. You'll be like, there's Nick. You know, <laughs> I wonder where he's been. Yeah. But we have a lot of people in the comments that are reaching out and saying hi to you. Oh, yeah. A lot of people that are saying hi from the camp because they remember oh, yeah. meeting at the camp. Uh, camp I know it's great. Cool. I know several of us were on the front porch with you until the wee hours of the morning, about three or four in the morning, just chit-chatting about stuff. I assume that's what the camp is. You're supposed to camp, camp out on the porch until until the sun rises. Yeah, exactly. And Bill Harrell is in there. the, 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 The camp that I, the last camp that I did felt what happened with the last camp there was a there was there was an absence is anyone um associated with the camp in in uh produ- production or in no, management i don't think anyone's in the audience casey and oscar i don't think are watching tonight yeah but the last camp i did and i think it was sort of the activities because there mm-hmm. there was like a day in advance, a pre, like the, the tours, we went and did the tours with, with, a, mm-hmm. with fan groups and we did like an ice cream social and, and a, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a, a breakfast also. And I, I thought all of those things um, really heightened it. And the last camp I did, did not have those. And I felt a little like it was less than it, yeah. than than it had been on like when we did the scavenger hunt and we were mm-hmm. hanging out and, and just, it was, it was awesome. Um, and, but, but there again, that was, that, that was a couple of years ago. So maybe they've ramped it back up. And then there was a rumor that I was doing this or someone reached out and said, I see you're doing the camp and I'm actually not scheduled. So I can hit Oscar up and see if I can, do they still do two camps? Uh, no, we're down to just doing the one in May, but they're going to be doing a, and here, and this is one, Lou, that you might be interested in. They're doing a camp in the fall called Scream City, and they're going to be kind of more focusing in on horror franchises uh-huh. uh, beyond The Walking Dead. And with your connections with Rob Zombie mm-hmm. film yeah. and with Texas Chainsaw, that might be yeah, that'd be venue, fun. A good yeah. venue for you to come into. But this year at the camp, it's just stupid packed with extra events. Yeah. It's oh, like, wow. It's like yeah. we're chasing our tail trying to figure out where we're going to be and when we're going to be there. It's event after event after yeah. event. And that picture that you guys just put up, we you were our trivia partner. Yeah. yeah. In there. <laughs> was, yeah, we did we did really well. Now wait, was we that was that we won? We won. We win. Yeah. yeah. We did. No thanks to me. You guys were you were very good. Um, but uh, oh yeah, mustache your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was fun. So yeah, was that at the hotel then? At yeah. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I had done good. one the year before. I want to say, or maybe two years before, where we all stayed at an Airbnb. Okay. I think that was the October. That must have been the family reunion. The Jacob Table. And, and that's the one I was talking about where it yeah. was really, it was really, it was really a lot of fun and busy. And I think, yeah, we had all the prisoners. Even Mark Marquis was there. Yeah. And Marquise. And um, 
And that was a lot of fun. We all actually yeah. stayed together <laughs> at an Airbnb, five bedrooms, which was, um, you know, appropriate. It was, let's just yeah. put it that yeah. way. It was, yeah. it was, uh, it was appropriate. Yeah, um, the, past, the past couple of years have been, they've really, and the actors, like you said, have really gotten engaged with the extra activities. And so they're just, I mean, they're just back to back to back this coming May. So yeah. definitely we'd like to have you back. We'd like to have Is you it, back for some porch sipping. Yeah, sipping I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to Oscar, but, but also maybe the scream, cause you know, it gets to be kind of, you do Atlanta once in, in a, like, in a quarter and, and you've done Atlanta. I know we used to be there a lot, but um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, we've done it so much uh, because I actually got hit up today from uh, Michelle uh, for something called Haunt, Haunt Atlanta. Oh, okay. Which is uh -huh. actually a charity event, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, so I'll check into the scream. Is that is that coming up in October? It yes. is, and it's going to be uh, what St. Augustine, Florida. Oh, that's good because yeah. that's not actually Atlanta. Oh, yeah. That would be so good. it's going to be at St. Augustine, Florida, and then keep the May camp there in Peachtree City at the hotel. Got it. I got it. And is Oscar running the scream as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I'll check in. Um, is is the May? Uh, he's probably booked for May. Hell, May's next month. Yeah, <laughs> May's crazy. That's why she said you can just come and hang out and yeah, work sipping. Uh, who's who's showing up at, at the, this? Uh, when, you're, not, who's, you're not. Who you're out not of this? Believe it. You're not going to believe it. We've got Josh McDermott, Lenny James, Pollyanna McIntosh. Um, God, who else? girls uh richie coster that's, that's fantastic yeah i layla, I, Rob uh, layla robbins yeah mm -hmm. i do believe it we've all been out of work for a year so i uh i don't doubt anyone's <laughs> available and also i don't know if steve's talked about it but we're off to a slow start so you know typically after a recession we try to uh uh re rebound Mm -hmm. um, you know, like after an economic recession or a war, we try to, you know, stimulate. And, and for some reason, the, the, the work is, um, been slow and they're calling it in general contraction, which is mm -hmm. tightening up or, um, uh, tightening up the belt, trimming the fat, if you will. And so it's had an effect on all of us and work and, and we just are still not working for God's sakes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it's, it's fr frustrating and also, um, uh, um, anxious. So when we get a chance to go mm -hmm. out and, and do something, uh, then I think it's, it's a blessing. So, uh, the, so I'm I'm happy to hear that, that that that's a good group and they're a lot of fun. The camp we event thought, that we were talking about is actually going to be in March of next year. The scream event. Yes. Yeah. It's March Saint, of next Saint, year. Saint Augustine, home of mm -hmm. uh, the Fountain of Youth, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we've got we've got a lot of Lou that we would like to talk about tonight. Oh yeah, please. I'm just I'm hogging the conversation. <laughs> no, you, we love that's you. The whole point, Lou in visit uh, yeah you, so i gotta throw up this picture here first of walker stalker with barb that's yeah <laughs> that's awesome i got it i just had to give her props that is awesome yeah she deserves props that's the truth <laughs> that is the well, truth here's a couple of projects that lou has done sons of thunder to unstoppable which is crazy yeah um, those are those are fun and so i have to ask you about angels in the outfield because i know barb is a big baseball fan and i know that you play yeah. baseball. Um, I, like your, I, I like your um your take on the picture so each one has a, a piece of my heart or in favor uh i um i uh people ask me all the time what's your favorite movie and and i'm glad that 
they ask that because I, I, I'm, I have an answer. And, and my movie on the studio end is unstoppable for the exact reason that you just said was it, it's kind of a crazy ride that yeah. I think still holds up today and it leaves you on the, on the edge of your seat. And then I get to be part of the hero team at the end, which was, which was yeah. just so much fun for me. So, so that race is one of my favorite. Um, Sons of Thunder was a project that I took on because it is a faith-based project. I'm a Christian and I have a lot of interest in being part of that message and, and that storytelling. And I don't get to do it as very often, even though I try to implement mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. a Bible verse somehow in almost everything I do. Um, I but like that. that being said, that that has a piece of my heart obviously and it was about um leaning into your faith that story uh on on television with of which it was built by peer flicks and um and so that was uh, uh, something that i love obviously and then angels in the outfield of course i love baseball it's my first and always passion and so that was a project that was i was I was in baseball as an employee of the Houston Astros. I played in the minor leagues and then moved on and became a scout and a coach. And one day I get a call from the owner and he asked me to come down to the field, suit up and bring bats and balls. And I'm assuming when this, this kind of thing happens and it's sort of when the owner has a friend whose son wants to try out, it's, it's all bullshit. We just kind of go through the, the pace is to, to let them feel good. And, and typically it's somebody that is well to do. Right. And so I assumed it was that, and I get down to the field and it's the actor, Charlie Sheen, and he's in Houston, Texas, and he's working, um, on a movie called, uh, um, the chase. Interesting connection here. Christy Swanson was doing this movie with him. Christy played my wife in Sons of Thunder, and uh, right. we're good friends. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the, the movie with Paul Rubens, God rest his soul. And there's God again. Uh, so uh, <laughs> full circle, uh, Charlie and I, he wants to work out playing baseball because he's going to go do Major League Two after this. And so he and I are, are becoming fast friends. This is well before Tiger Blood, uh, and I'm winning, but... He's got a lot of, uh, he's a movie star with a lot of social habits. So, and I'm a little nervous, but we go to a birthday party of his in Houston and I run into some of his friends have flown in from Los Angeles to in particular uh, producer and director for Disney. And they're going to make this movie. And we got to having some sipping on the porch stuff and, <laughs> They're like, don't Charlie's going to ask you to go, you know, carry his bags and angels in the outfield or pardon me in Major League Two. You don't want to do that. Come do our movie Angels in the Outfield in Los Angeles. I, and I was like, yeah, that'd be a good idea. I'll do that. So I took time off from my job with the Astros and I'd already been I'd, I'd already been studying acting and but I had this incredible baseball career. I was looking for major league baseball players all over the, the nation and, and in the Latin American countries. And I had a job and a expense report and a company car and a salary and pension. And I don't know. Um, well, I do know, uh, I followed a girl into a building uh, with a nice pair of jeans and, and it ended up being a, a theater. And I was like, Oh wow, those are my people. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> if you, can't, if you can't tell. Mm -hmm. I did take the job with Angels in the Outfield. I took my vacation, lined up about three weeks, and went out and worked uh, for for Bill Deere, the director. And, um, you know, that's Danny Glover. Uh, um, there's so many cool people in that movie. Adrian Brody was in that movie, but uh, there was a kid that I played catch with every day and his name was Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun. But my favorite was that I got to um, 
meet Ben Johnson, who was also in that movie. Uh, While I was doing that, the Houston Astros got sold. Uh, There was a new owner and a new guy running the team, Bob Watson, who I knew. He was a friend of mine. And he just called and he's like, hey, Lou Boy, uh, you don't have to rush home. You can take a couple extra weeks. And I was like, "Uh, that doesn't sound good. I better get back. And I, I did. And he was like, look, I can tell there's something um interesting you about this career baseball is a lifetime career which you're already heading down that path if you don't do this now and follow acting you never will and i'm like are you firing me and he's like nope but i'm not rehiring you and (laughs) uh and the rest is history uh look i had an opportunity to take a job with the san diego padres Ah. right away and then i heard his voice saying if you don't do it now you never will so i I kind of give him a lot of credit for him and the girl with the tight pair of jeans uh, for my acting <laughs> with my acting career. So here's a couple more that you've done. Yeah, man. Those are great. Obviously, those are big studio projects. Um, I had done Rango with Gore Verbinski. Mm-hmm. And um, so he invited me to come out and do Lone Ranger. And I had had a Johnny Depp experience, which was great. The best part of the Lone Ranger was that my group of castmates and teammates, we were the Rangers that, that went into the canyon, got ambushed. We were like two months in cowboy camp. And by the end of it, and we just were boys on horses. It was We were like 12-year-old boys. But we didn't even want to come into set. We, we were just like, screw the movie. This is great. We're getting paid and we're just out here in the bunkhouse eating steaks and, you know, roping and riding every morning and, and all day. It was awesome. So that was a great experience of like, like a dude ranch experience, you know, it was really great. And um, I'll never forget that. Uh, and it was, it, the movie was, uh, was a lot of fun too, but preparing to make the movie was exponentially even more fun. Um, I'd gotten a call by my agent that said, Hey, you have a meeting. It's kind of private and very nondescript. Would you be at this address tomorrow at noon or whatever? So, and when I got there, I kind of knew where it was because I'd been there before. I knew it was a casting office. So, uh, and I'm sitting in the lobby and there, there's no preparation or anything. And, and out of the office door walks Quentin Tarantino. Lou Temple, my God, you're great. And getting back to Unstoppable, one of his top five favorite movies, by the way, just based on the action. And everybody loves Tony Scott movies. And yeah. so uh, he particularly liked that I was, um, that I showed very well in the movie. And so we started talking. He was so effusive and this is telling me about my whole career, like you guys are, you, that you're doing. And by the time I left that meeting, I thought once about once once upon a time in Hollywood was about me. Uh, I was gonna. <laughs> I thought I was gonna be the lead of the movie, and uh, <laughs> you know. You, and so, and this is what he does. He's like the Pied Piper, and he gets you so enthused and so full of hot air that you show up and you're so energized, and then you sit around and wait. I always r- relate it to like being on an all-star team and not really getting to play. You know, I didn't do very much and the little bit that I did, a lot of it got cut. And, uh, but looking back on it, I got to watch him work and I got to watch (laughs) DiCaprio navigate Quentin. I got to watch Brad Pitt work. I got to watch Pacino work. You know, I got to see an awful lot. And at the time I might've been a little frustrated, but looking back on it, it was really an amazing experience, I have to say. So we have a lot of family members and most of the people that are on the comments are big horror fans. Oh, wow. And and I have to say that I agree completely. Uh, The four of us love it. Um, You you were in two of Rob Zombie's movies that everybody just went gaga over, Halloween and The Devil's Rejects. Um, A couple of them, of course, Tyler Maine will be at the camp this year. Oh, good for Tyler. Yeah. He is so tall. It's crazy. He stands up and keeps standing up. Yeah. Um, You're telling me. (laughs) So one of the questions in the comments was, um, 
what is your favorite scene in Halloween? Oh, uh, the, you know, so keeping in mind that Rob did two Halloweens. And so uh, I always, you know, kind of, they're both Rob's Halloweens and one's kind of like a little brothers. We were really trying to pay homage to Mr. Carpenter with ours and then uh, introduce a backstory. Um, I have to say my favorite scene in the Halloween that I was participating in was the big Joe Grizzly scene, which is the fight between um, Ken Foray and, and Tyler Main in yeah. the rest stop uh, yeah. bathroom stall. And mm -hmm. that literally was a real stall. And, and those are two really big men in real life and very physical guys. And I guess they hooked up and you know, Tyler's an ex professional wrestler and I'm here to tell you, I don't have to tell you Ken Foray can handle himself. And apparently they just beat that bathroom to hell. And I love, I just, I love that scene because to me it harkens back to sort of a, a 70s yeah. mono -y mono thing that used to be there. There was a movie called The Deep way back in the day yeah. with uh, uh, Nick Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there were two huge men that squared off. You know, one was a Haitian guy and one was kind of a, a big white henchman for, I think Robert Shaw was in that movie as well from Jaws. And um, they, they, and so this has that element to it. Uh, the physical stuff is great, but the, the manner in which they cat they they cat and moused and and who's going to win between these two between you know Godzilla and, 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 and yeah exactly <laughs> and so I love that challenge and I think I love that from yeah. just my boyhood and for that exact thing that we just said I've always yeah. I've always liked two greats squaring mm -hmm. up and all you know you sort of don't want one to lose right I. I always rooted for Frazier, but I loved Ali, you know? Right. And so um, that's a long answer to a, a very honest question, but that's my favorite scene in that particular Halloween. Um, we had, you know, uh, Rob hired Tyler first, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then he hired Danny and I right away to do these two roles. And he, and he, he said, look, uh, I'm going to switch gears. Danny, you're going to be the sweetheart and the nice guy, Ismael. And Lou, you're going to be the asshole. And I'm like, oh, what? And he's <laughs> like, yeah, shouldn't be much of a stretch. And so uh, I really pushed it very hard and, uh, you know, was very uh, hard on Danny and his heritage, you know, the Latin heritage. Uh uh, very bigoted, if you will. And then just really a problem, just a little jerk <clears throat> with the Napoleonic complex. That was the whole motive and trying to get Michael Myers under my thumb to do this very bad thing. So in Rob's cut for those, and I'm sure you've all seen his director's cut, but we have a scene, it's a rape scene and mm -hmm. It was really intense and Rob had really wanted it to be so. And so he cleared the set and made it very private, very safe for the young lady uh, that was working with us, Devin. And he had used her in the, um, uh, the thing that he had done with Tarantino and, and Robert Rodriguez, the um, SS werewolf women of, of, uh, Naziville or something. And so she, <laughs> she was okay um, being exposed, let's say. And so yeah. uh, Courtney Gaines and I were very uh, respectful and it wasn't easy. It's just sort of not neat, not, not our nature, but Rob really wanted us to, we took a long time to kind of go there. My point is we put a lot of work into it all day and mm -hmm. it was exhausting and ugly. And and then the Weinsteins were very nervous about uh, the female audience not accepting it. These are the Weinsteins, by the way. 
or at least Harvey. And so they went to Rob and said, look, could we get that scene replaced with something and we'd be happy to pay. And, and Rob took advantage of that and said, yeah, I use Bill Mosley and Leslie Easterbrook and, and Tom Towles, and we can have Michael Myers escape a different way. But on his cut, he did use that. So that was the worst thing I'd ever done on film up to, uh, that was Noel Klug's. Uh, I did another Rob Zombie movie called 31 where I placed oh, that. That, was, that was crazy, crazy yeah. movie. That's the worst thing I've ever done on film. That was, uh, that was, and, and I say that because I never was typically you want to find a reason or motivation as to why this person is like, I had just explained why Noel was, was such a miserable jerk but mm -hmm. i couldn't really ever find the reason for psycho head you know why are these people so even sherry wasn't that likable in that movie mm -hmm. um so i i'm happy and at the time i think it's the record must be broke by now but at the time we had opened on labor day and I, at 58 million we were the largest labor day opening ever with our halloween wow. uh and so that was um that was just a lot of fun, obviously. Um, and then how do I speak to the devil's rejects? Uh, I knew the casting director, Monica Mickelson, because she had cast me in a movie called Serving Sarah, which I was unable to do. She had remembered me and brought me in for Rob Zombie to read. And I'm sitting in the, um, this was back when you'd go into the rooms and, and, I, and there's Steve Zahn and Jeremy Davies, and they're reading for Adam Banjo, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm a big fan of these two dudes, and, you know, this is, this must be a real movie, and I, I, I guess I knew Rob Zombie from, like, White Zombie, but I didn't really know him as an auteur mm -hmm. at all, at all, and maybe I didn't listen to his music as much as I did Merle Hager, to be honest, <laughs> but then I went Me to... Either. I was in Austin and Monica calls and said, Hey, Rob really liked your tape and he likes you. And I'm like, Oh wow. Okay, cool. Okay. Just letting you know. I'm like, yeah, cool. You know, I'm just thinking, God, there's good. What else? You know? Okay. And then she called two days later. She goes, yeah, you're going to get an offer for this role. And then I start freaking out because I was like, Holy shit. Cause I'd never read anything like this. The very mm -hmm. first page, a nude woman is being drugged through the forest by a giant. And I'm like, what the hell? I didn't even know they, cause I had no horror exposure other than as a boy, maybe, you know, the hammer films, Frankenstein, Dracula, maybe the Hills have eyes. I can't really know that I was that engaged in the horror genre that much. Definitely the wolf man, uh, dark shadows, but yes, I called my buddy Walton Goggins and I said, Hey, you did that house of a thousand corpses. I got a problem. This Rob zombie, this devil worshiper, he's going to go uh, ask me to make this movie. And I'm not sure. I, he's like, Oh, shut up. Shut up, dude. Uh, do yourself a favor. Go do this movie. It'll be a great experience in your art life and you'll make a friend for life. And those are true words. That's exactly what happened. I think we caught lightning in a bottle on Devil's Rejects for uh, the reason that that four guys, um, Sid Haig, God rest his soul, Ken, right. Ken, uh, Bill Mosley, mm -hmm. uh, Ken Foray, and um, William Forsyth have this innate special um, skill that is very specific to the horror genre, which I had never been exposed to, but the more I watched, the more I started to understand how they started to ever so slightly lean into camera and they were infringing on your personal space. Yeah. And they would do this like in every scene and I would just see them all of a sudden and I would be like, <laughs> wow, everything's changing. And, right, but right. and this might just be from going from your heels to your toes, just ever so slightly. And I think this is a skill set that we, there's a lot of horror movies out there and we don't see this much anymore. I mean, this, this goes all the way back to 
Bella Lugosi, you know, Lon yeah. Chaney. This goes uh-huh. back to really great. Uh, uh, Vincent Price, you know, there's there's oh, an yeah. element that was, and I think that was what was huge there. And that Rob, uh, he let everybody off the leash and everybody took it. Those four in particular were like the leaders the, and, and the, and from the table read, it was very apparent that this was going to be a very special movie. Wow. And so I'm really proud of that movie, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. I got to work with Jeffrey Lewis. The very first time I met him, he handed me a business card. It said, Clint Eastwood's best friend. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was wonderful. And of course, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, um, Juliette Lewis's daddy. And yeah. uh, he was great. He was he was so fun. He's like, you know, whenever you work with the lead of the movie, you always put your hand on their shoulder when you're talking to them. That way, you can't get cut out of the movie. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> really? There you go, Jason. The, there was your answer. There's an advice for your actors. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's a good thing. Hey, there's Axel. Yeah. So we um, absolutely love Axel. One of it, one of our favorite characters. Oh, that's he was kind of you to say. Character. There's so many it good was, characters. And, probably, and the so one I get, time, probably the one time that I would look at somebody in prison and go, you know, I could hang out with that guy. <laughs> well, that was the goal. I have to say, I wanted, I wanted Axel to be someone that we all felt um, that we knew that yeah. that, that, that there, there was an uncle or a cousin or um, a. a you know, a wayward dad or something that we were, uh, we could all uh, attach to. You know, originally, when I read, I think I've told this story before, but I was called in to read for Merle. And uh, Merle had that speech up on the roof, which was great, where the very first episode. And um, uh, thankfully, they gave that to Michael Rooker, and who, who else could have done Merle? And then they called in a few weeks later and they said, uh, um, could you read for Merle's brother? Axel came around. They, they definitely were aware of me and, and uh, they sent me some uh, dummy sides. It was very funny. I'll never forget because it was T-Dog and Axel talking about facial hair. You know, how do you get your facial hair and your mustache to do it? And, <laughs> ridiculous but it was really fun so i kind of uh had a lot of fun with that and then i was actually still doing the lone ranger when i got hired for the walking dead and i had this you know handlebar um western mustache and i was sure they were you know so often they're they're like yeah you got to shave and i'm like i'm not done with this movie and i can't actually shave so I might have to pass. And they're like, no, we, we like the mustache. You can bring the mustache. I'm like, yeah, you say that. But I know once I get into makeup, someone's going to whack it and I'll be in trouble on with Disney. And right. you don't want to piss the mouse off, believe me. And so what I was really was like trying to negotiate to see how much they wanted me. So I passed on The Walking Dead like two or three times. And they're like, really? You sure you don't want to do this? And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Just make sure the mustache stays in place. And then when I showed up, because um, I had known Norman just from being here in Los Angeles and auditioning, I showed up and I couldn't find him. Like I was looking for Norman on the trailers. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's his character's name? Daryl. Let's see, where's Daryl? I'll go knock on his door. No, Daryl. Oh, these weird names like Godzilla and, um, you, you know, the Martian and all these like <laughs> code names. I had no idea. I'd never seen anything like that, but they were already by then, the beginning of season three, forecasting that the fandomonium was going to take place. So they were trying to keep everything on the hush hush. Um, you know, I hadn't been used to that. I hadn't been used to like, you You can't have a script because we don't trust you with it. I'm like, what the hell? Uh, but it was great. It was really, um, it, 
I can't s- say enough about it. I've never had the experience to be with some project where everybody's pulling on the same side of the rope and everybody's in invested to do as good a job as they possibly can and then to do better next week. It, it was really an, an experience so gratifying and validating. And everybody would say that. Nobody, I've never talked to anyone that said, you know, I didn't really, I didn't dig it on the walkie. It was amazing. And I'm grateful to that I got to be there on kind of a singular focus. So all roads still led to the sheriff when I was there. There weren't multiple storylines per se. We were building the governor for sure, but it still was about Rick, you know, and how Rick was going to deal with that. I mean, once you got into, let's see, I guess Hilltop. Well, wait, wait, maybe Alexandria. Wait, who came first, Alexandria Hilltop? Alexandria. I guess by Alexandria, there were multiple storylines, but for the most yeah. part, it was still about Rick. By Hilltop, it was really starting. So in other words, the writers were having to do more for other characters than they ever had. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great challenge. I think that opened up for the, for, for the audience a lot to invest even more in characters that they were interested in. And then, um, and you know, by the time Jeffrey Dean showed up, it was, you know, uh, a variety of stories. Mm-hmm. And I think that it didn't change the dynamic. It opened the show up a lot. And so it opened the show up to be more diverse, I think. Uh, a little bit of something for everyone per se um they didn't necessarily have as much time i know it put a lot of pressure on the writers and a lot of pressure on the crew to get all the stories told so uh the show um became even even more important to get it right you know so it it just never got there was never a rest on that show but from for us there wasn't either, but it was really just a great, great experience. And I, I assume everyone you talk to would say the same, you know. And what was interesting to me, by season three, they had been, they'd spent a year at Herschel's farm, right? Mm-hmm. And that was great. It was very kumbaya and, and campfire stories. And, and uh, but I think it was time to kind of open up, needed to breathe a little bit. The audience was ready for, to move on. And so, the excitement of, ooh, new meat, new fresh blood, new players was great. It was really wonderful to say, holy shit, and, and expose ourselves in that moment, watching Herschel get his leg cut out, right? Yeah, amongst those 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 rascals. And so um, Jack Stork had a question for you. He said, okay, when, Doug. Yay. When, your, when your group was discovered in the prison, there was a room apparently you all had been using as a restroom. Oh, yeah. No rest in that room, I promise you. (laughs) When Rick's group opened that door, they reacted to a hideous smell. But I think he's talking about the kitchen and the freezer, the refrigerator. Was that all acting or did they put a bad odor in the refrigerator? Uh, That was all acting. Okay. Yeah, that was so interesting because um, that whole prison was built as a set piece. It looked like it was so practical. They hung cobwebs and dust and it was all clean, brand new studio dressing. It was amazing. And so uh, it, 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 they didn't have anything bad other than when um, we'd find a walker and it would be eating something it'd be like brisket so sometimes the halls would smell of barbecue and uh and that wasn't entirely unpleasant i have to say uh but yeah that uh we did have uh the room um that that probably had some stench but we had we had we had to work that that's the fine acting of the of the five prisoners yeah Right. So you guys did very well. Yes. So that's is it some of, that's some of Theotis, Theotis Crane's best acting, I promise you. 
<laughs> is it safe to say that you've actually finished the series? Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. I, you know, interestingly, because, and you know this, because we're out so much amongst, I found that it was advantageous to know what was going on so that I could engage in conversation with, with the audience. Um, and be, and also be interested. So I tried to keep in time with it. I, um, I might have lagged here and there, but for the most part, I, I tried to stay up with, with all that was happening out of interest, you know, and, and I sort of became an audience member, you know, like, like everyone. And so I realized what, when you become an audience member, there's a certain responsibility to being, um, uh, up to date, up to speed, well versed, have an opinion, be able to express it with some ideas, accept others. You know, there there became this whole um, uh, protocol. I felt like of being out at conventions or being in Walking Dead podcasts, where you needed to be able to. Uh, I mean, I, I I felt responsible. So, and also I kind of was like everyone else. And I didn't get, I got, in the beginning, I got some insight because I was in touch with the guys enough. Mm -hmm. um, just verily, because we were so used to texting, like mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, Norman would say something. I'd be like, holy shit, that's going to happen? Wow, okay. And hadn't you worked with Greg Nicotero on I, Texas Chainsaw? Yeah, we had. In fact, so... The very first episode that Greg ever directed was uh, where so interesting. Um, we're I forget the episode name and number, but we're burying uh, Stephen Yen and and Vincent and myself. We're out burying some of the dead. Yeah, and Stephen's lamenting over loss of life and friends, and we were trying to explain to him, <laughs> like you know, look on the bright side. At least you had some friends. We don't have many friends. You know? <laughs> but I remember I felt like Stephen was very engaged in his digging and, and, um, and I was standing and I was seeing his face and all this emotion was happening. And I was like, Stephen, uh, the camera's behind you. I don't know if, if they don't cover you, all this good shit's going to get lost. You've got to, you gotta, you know, let the camera see what's going on there. <laughs> it was sort of, and I didn't know Stephen that well, but we we were friendly enough that I felt comfortable saying that. He's like, "Oh, thanks, man. This guy's won an Oscar. Who am I yeah. telling this guy anything to do? What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, come on. That guy should tell. He should have told me to go shit in my hat right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Denai showed up, and uh, oh yeah. She, she, she showed up a month in advance because she was doing katana training mm -hmm. and she wasn't, she was on set, but she wasn't really, she was part of production, but she wasn't on camera or in any of the scenes. And I remember talking to her, I was probably three episodes in or something and like, yeah, you're going to like it here, kid. It's pretty good. And you mind your piece and cues. You might stick around a little bit and, you know, like, holy shit, this is, you know, arguably it was, it ended up being her show. I mean, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> again, I'm very gullible about my own, you know, status. Uh, getting back to, hey, guess what? Quentin Tarantino is making a movie and it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> and Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio are going to be in it. <laughs> hey, this guy Rick and some character named Michonne, they're going to help Axel, you know, get through this apocalypse. Um, now, you yeah. actually worked with uh, the showrunner, Glenn Mazzara, to kind of help develop um, Axel's final episode, right? Yeah, you know, so he called and he said, look, we got, and he and I had just been out to dinner talking about interesting layers of axle and where we could go it was the last thing i would he could have probably he didn't he didn't indicate that we were coming up to this but it made sense i mean look i knew at this point 
because of the material, the source material, that Axel did die. But mm -hmm. I was thinking that the character was going to land well enough that we could extend it, like for a season. And 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 um, he said, yeah, what the problem is, is we've got the governor showing up and we can't let him be impotent. So he's he's got to draw blood, first blood. And we painted ourselves into a corner because we have to have this happen um, rather soon or he's just going to be a big wimp. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what about what about some of these other assholes? Like, uh, you know, what about, uh, you know, I mean, I, at that point, I mean, the, the, like Tyrese and uh, they had just shown up. I'm like, you don't see, I didn't, I guess I didn't. I mean, I knew Tyrese was going to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I was picking on Daniel May. I'm like, you know, take Daniel out. That guy, you don't need, you know, one's going to, he goes, that's not the point. It needs to hurt. And it will mm -hmm. with Axel. And I'm like, okay. So, yeah. you know, you do this denial dance, but then he was like, but we haven't committed to that. And just so you know, there's some other people that are on the list, like serious regular that I never would offer as to who, mm -hmm. but when the word got out that I was going down, they would all come up and go, God, we just read the script. You just heard that sucks. And I'm like, you have no idea how close it was to being you. Uh, <laughs> so then. Take him like, up from the team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have no idea, Andrew Lincoln, how close it was to being you. <laughs> this is my show. Uh, and so. Glenn said, well, look, you want to come to the writer's room? And I'm like, no, the, these guys are amazing. They, these guys write great. I would say this. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I don't want. But now that you met, now that you asked, uh, I thought it was really interesting. The Zabruder tapes with the Kennedy assassination, and how shocking that was when he got yeah. shot. And I just offered that. I thought that was really Ugh. that be that could be impactful and so that yeah. they were able to pull that off yeah. and it was i knew what i wanted to do i knew that was going to work but then i also what what they didn't know was that i was going to leave it all on carol I was going to make Melissa have to deal with it, with my blood on her, on her hands, my body, everything. I was just going to be a sack of potatoes in her lap. And however she dealt with that in the, and, and, and then what I didn't know was there was going to be this firefight going on at the same time. So I was trying to give her this moment of, Oh no, when the moment called for, oh shit, I need to get, you know, find shelter, which is Axel's body, sandbag Axel, and, <laughs> um, and hide behind that, which was genius and brilliant. So it all worked great. I'm really proud of it. Um, we, it was so interesting because we didn't make a meal out of it and we just did it. Yeah. And it worked. It was mm -hmm. just like, it was just organic and it worked perfect. And Melissa was mm -hmm. great as she always is. Um, and it, it was, you know, I was adamant about not making the day. What was the challenge and the trap of that scene was not to forecast it, to let anyone know that it was coming, you know, and to make it uh, a happy day, kind of sad, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, uh you know like the whole story and the tap on the shoulder and the fun and and the joking and the connection and then boom that was yeah. perfect that's what we yeah. really were we really were trying to land that which i'm really yeah. gr grateful that that we were able to but you definitely did for yeah. sure everybody was shocked yes it was it was a gut punch and that's that's what we wanted yeah we, we wanted to they've had so many you know, but that mm -hmm. might have been one of the first ones, I think, that caught people off guard. And then uh, mm -hmm. 
then they started, you know, happening. They didn't go to the well too often, but, you know, sparingly they would all of a sudden, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that just happened. Well, a lot of people in the comments say they would have loved to have seen Axel last longer. They would have loved to have seen the Axel in Alexandria, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. we would actually, Destiny, our friend Destiny is in the comments. She said that she'd like to see a backstory on Axel, and I would agree with that. Yeah, we had always interesting, and Glenn had talked about it, and Scott, you know, we, we Scott was always there as well, Scott Gimple, um, uh, that, you know, they, they were always, you know, Lenny made them so delicious, these standalone episodes, right? Mm -hmm. And we always thought that, that, or talked about that the standalone prison riot scene like the attica mm -hmm. thing would have been great yeah uh how how the five of us got locked in mm -hmm. and um but with it, they killed us all there was no one to tell the story and reflect back on it you know uh <laughs> and by the time if you had done it what episode you know we were all dead at that point so it would have been like huh you know I don't, it maybe wouldn't have held the same value but yeah we would we definitely wanted to and and you know as in the comics or right, the graphic novels um axel also had this backstory where you know he was kind of lascivious and and uh i i had reserved those fangs in the closet if they ever wanted to go out that that route as well with yeah. like, you know, uh, with Beth or something. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there, it was great because I, it, where I first came to be affronted by not knowing how it was gonna go, I came to appreciate and become inspired by the unknown of how the writers were gonna build something, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Norman gave me great, advice he's like look uh you can build your own character here you know that just stay interesting stay engaged and and drop seeds and the writers will pick them up and grow them so i started calling him johnny appleseed because he was great at that he'd go and grab a crossbow or he'd go hop on a motorcycle and lo and behold we got this crossbow squirrel hunting motorcycle cool guy you know and and uh it was entirely a genius place and so i think that that growth and evolution to character is really what gay inspired all the all the actors and the audience too i think the audience um, entirely enjoyed it yeah Ooh, is something going on between those two you know and yeah and uh you and got the short hair <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got the, that's right i got the short hair <laughs> that scene was supposed to have been done the next day and and we had been cruising through and the director uh he said hey let's hit this uh scene you know 12 uh 12 20 and carol uh melissa and i both looked at each other like oh shoot that's kind of a big scene we only got like an hour left in the day and he goes, nah, we'll get it. And you know what? He was right because I think he sensed that we were really going to try and make a meal out of it. And he mm -hmm. removed all that preparation, all that going home. And and that scene works because of, of Melissa's reaction and mm -hmm. response, you know, and it, which is pitch perfect. And so I feel like we we caught a little lightning in a bottle in that in getting it thrown in there at the end of the day as opposed to you know really making a you know we're going to make a big deal out of this big scene and really work it and uh and sometimes it, it just becomes too much and in this instance it was just enough it was perfect yeah it was great well, we really enjoyed Axel. Axel was a fantastic character, as are all of the characters. That yeah, I thought he was great. And, and um, you know, I, I wanted him to be uh, a, a person who wore his heart on his sleeve and a man of the people. And, and you know, was. things like the short hair. He just said what everybody was thinking, right? You know, and, <laughs> right. and, and so that would be him. And he was just sort of working too hard to be a friend working a little, yeah. quick, a little bit too, you know, ingratiating himself, you know, and uh, uh, 
I thought he he had a lot of endearing qualities, and he and, definitely and, did. Yes, he did. And and some weird idiosyncrasies too, you know. And that's just part of the show, you know. So I was led to believe that he was a, a you know a drug addict, heroin, uh, on the front of the show, and then they switched gears on mm-hmm. me. So I spent the first four or five episodes white knuckling, right? And then had to explain that my hands were cold. And (laughs) and so it was ridiculous, but it it kept me challenged and on my feet. And again, I think that's a big part of why the show's so great, because it's like an audience participation video game. You got to see and change the people in the midst, you know? Right, right. Well, we appreciate you being on, Lou. Oh, it's been a, been a hoot. Thank absolutely you. Absolutely loved the interaction. Everybody in the, in the chat has just over the moon with you. Oh, good. Um, do you want to do the questions, ladies? Yes. Okay. So, Lou, I don't know if you know who James Lipton is, but yes. he did, Okay. So, he did the show inside the actor's studio, and he always yes. liked to end his. Uh, his interactions with a list of questions. And so we like to do the same thing. So can we ask you some questions? Be my honor. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Okay. So my first question is my favorite question of all times. It's the best one right out of the gate. What's your favorite curse word? (sighs) (laughs) My favorite curse word is bullshit. And, and, and if I really am happy to say it, it's grade A. That's some grade A bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. 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 All right. So my next question is, other than the curse word, what is your favorite word? Yes. Okay. I like it. What's your least favorite word? No. <laughs> you definitely projected that one, buddy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm... I, I, I realize uh, I, anytime I say no, um, I'm missing out. And mostly when I say yes, I have no idea of the experience that's coming forth with it. Well, we're glad you said yes to us for coming on the show. Yay. Um, what turns you on? Thank you. What turns, oh, what turns me on? What turns me on? Um, oh. Uh, uh, discovery, discovery turns me on. So, uh, I, and when I, what I mean by that is, um, uh, in search of and finding actually in search of the process of discovery. So it's okay. called, um, it's called fishing, not catching. Right. So right. I enjoy finding and, or looking for the character uh, more than I enjoy the character, finding the character. So uh, we call we call the process in building a character discovery, not so much in that, oh, here's who this is, but it's discovery like in the, the law term is finding out right. what, how the case is built. And so that's my, my, that turns me on. What turns you off? Um, Human, human suffering, pain, oddly, as many horror movies as I'm in, it really, it really bothers me to see people physically hurt or being hurt. And, uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't get excited or titillated by that. Okay. Uh, the last question for me is, uh, we like to change it up a little bit. So I have a personal one. Yes. Uh, if you can have three people to a dinner party oh. from baseball, dead or alive, yeah, who would it be? Oh, definitely um, um, Mr. Ruth. You know, I, I would definitely have the babe and as many hot dogs and beer as, as he wants. Um, that would be amazing. Uh, another gentleman... Um, because he's there uh, that I'd like to have uh, would be Jackie Robinson. Today's Jackie Robinson day, by the way. Uh, uh, 
1947, April 15th, number 42, took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I think that would be amazing um, to have him there with Babe. And then uh, I am a huge um, Johnny Bench fan. So, and, and he's still with us, so he'd be able to uh, mix in really well uh, with those with those two. So that's a great question. There's so many. And I've been fortunate to, through my baseball career, to have had some exposure. Like, um, I never had dinner with him, but I did have drinks with Henry Aaron, which was super cool. Uh, I met, I have had dinner with Nolan Ryan often. So, and that's, that's like an American legend. My, yeah. he, he's like a real John Wayne in my yeah. estimation. So, um, Oh. I mean, it's not like having dinner with Norman Reedus, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's it's pretty and cool. Norman too. <laughs> you know, it got to be where we, you know, in the beginning we could have dinner. We enjoyed dinner and we enjoyed the camaraderie, and that would be with Scott and Sarah. One of the things that I wanted to say about the 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 show in its uh, beginning, and I think it carried all the way through, and I think it's a big part of why the show was so successful is that the three of them, this would be um, Sarah, uh, Andrew Lincoln, obviously, uh, him first, Sarah and John Berenthal got together and said, look, we're doing a show. Uh, it's an unlikely show. It, it's about an unlikely setting with unlikely vehicles in the form of walkers. We might not get past these six episodes, but we've never had this opportunity so what if we go out and do the best work possible as if we were doing the west wing or shakespeare what if we really give it everything and respect it and respect the audience with craftsmanship maybe we'll get another job out of this that was the foundation of the work and so that was that baton. That's what was passed to me when I showed up. Hey, we're and and the invitation that you that you're brought in to help build and to be part of the family is just incredible. Because I've been guest stars on shows where you're a stepchild. You know, you're here today and see ya. And so that wasn't the case here. And when you showed up, that mantra: we do the best work we can here. We're really looking for you to add on and and we're going to do it all again the following week. And we're so happy to have you that. And so that's what I passed on to the next group. And I'm hearing that that was passed on all the way through and that carried through. So um, in the beginning, before they were so popular, we'd all go to dinner and be left alone. And then Norman, it was crazy. We couldn't go to dinner anymore with him or you know, we'd wait for four hours for him to get done signing and, and you know, <laughs> our stakes were all cold by then. And, and, uh, and, you we're know, sorry. And, yeah. And Jeffrey, you know, he got so popular so fast and it's it stopped. We started eating in the back, in the, in the kitchen, actual kitchen, you know, where they were cooking our food. And I don't know, that wasn't quite as much fun. So it, it, um, it changed, but it was still, it, it was still great. And I, I still, I'm really happy for the spinoffs, the people that are continuing with the story and enjoying it. And um, I'm I'm uh, proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Okay, Dawn. Uh, what's your favorite sound? Oh, that's a good question. I like, uh, I like, early morning birds chirping yes. yeah we haven't had that one yet okay <laughs> least favorite sound oh early morning lawn blowing uh, <laughs> or out here a helicopter you know like believe it or not there's that those that to me that's annoying yeah and then I add one question. If you had a birthday party and you could invite three musicians or bands, dead or alive, who would you invite? That's a great question. Uh, I definitely would invite Elvis. Uh, I, I so would invite Elvis. 
Um, I would invite uh, Louis Prima. I'm a huge Louis Prima fan. Um, uh, 40s, kind of a 40s swinger. And uh, I probably would invite, as long as he was getting along with the band, I would invite Fogarty and Creedence Clearwater. <laughs> as long as they were getting along. There you go. That's amazing that I left out Hank Williams or, or uh, you know, or, um, but, uh, <laughs> and, or Buddy Holly. You know, it's amazing mm -hmm. that, that, I, that I left out uh, George Jones or, uh, you know, Marty Robbins, any of those greats. But, may, you know, can't have them all. Right. Lisa? Lou, what profession other than your own or baseball would you have liked to have attempted? Oh, that's an interesting question. And that's probably changed over the course of time when I've been experienced um, or exposed to, to more things. But recently, believe it or not, I'm interested in uh, dentistry. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by how the mouth and teeth work. Now, I've never worked on teeth. Uh, but I've had some teeth worked on and, and it's been way better than it used to be. So I'm kind of curious how that technology gets so advanced up to this point. Um, I, I would, uh, I'd be interested in, in doing that. Um, I also think that I, um, I would like, uh, because I do like solving things or I like I like um, I like the fishing aspect, so I think that I I'm interested in um, uh, maybe being an attorney solving a case. Believe it or not, oh, cool. yeah. What what um, occupation or profession would you not want to try? Uh, I don't think I would want to be a police officer. Uh, I've never been great with authority and I respect yep. authority and I, my granddad was a police officer. I just think that maybe it's this day and age. I don't think they get the respect they deserve. Let's put it that way. I think they have to work harder, um, y you know, to be just to survive. There's just a lot besides protect and mm -hmm. serve that is right. uh, put upon them. And I do respect them and I, I just would not want to yeah. not want to be them. Let's put it that way. Well, knowing that you had a very near death experience in 2002. And yeah, you, man. you are a leukemia survivor. Congratulations. Thank yes. you. Um, and knowing that you and I are both Christian. Yes. And we believe that heaven exists. So what words do you hope to hear God say to you when you get to the pearly gates? Well done, good and faithful servant. You ran the good race. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I also feel that, um, our experience as Christians, um, are ever changing, ever growing, ever evolving. And, um, I think like just in like technology, you've got to sort of adapt, you know, mm -hmm. things are different. And I, I think uh, God is the great programmer. So just when you think that I'm, I'm, I'm good, I got it in line or I should be, he'll switch it up on you. He'll switch the operating system and it, and it won't be mm -hmm. compatible as much right. and right. you'll have to adjust. And uh, um, so I, I'm becoming more aware and appreciative of that in, in the, uh, in the walk. And so, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but it's, it's the right challenge, right? Well, we, we are grateful for you and we're grateful for the family that you are a part of, that you helped create for us and for so many. And, uh, we hope that you'll join us again sometime. Oh, I'm always in my pleasure. Uh, you know, there'll be this, uh, there'll be this walking dead, um, uh, um, kind of new group that will, uh, come up with their, their, 
look, here's what we're going to see when they redo The Walking Dead. Yes. And we'll mm -hmm. all be here to sit and we'll be rattling our sabers. Uh, <laughs> don't pee on our grass. <laughs> but we'll have conversations about, well, here's how the OG was really built and how it was, how it favored and what they were trying to do. And here was the, you know, and, and, and they will enthusiastically listen and, mm -hmm. and be amazed. And they probably already are, you know, they have, um, you're so lucky that you've developed, I don't want to say lucky. That's not the right word. You're, you're very wise in that you're you've developed rapport and relationships and conversations and studies with the workings of the show you know that next generation is just going to do a lot of guest you know they're gonna they're not going to get inside like this unless they right. do a lot, but they will have deep dive access on youtube and what you know to be able to hear it and say, oh, that's, you know, this is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, th they're into that. They they like hearing about what's up. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's weird because they they look at us as so old. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, I mean, 16 year olds look at us, but then also because they see the show and they're thrilled with the show, they there's a lot of favor there too. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. You, you and a 16 year old would be able to actually have a milkshake and go, that's pretty cool. Who's your yeah. favorite? I like, I like Carol. Oh yeah. I like Michonne. Oh yeah. I get that. You know, you, there's, yeah. there's some, there's, there's, and that was what the phenomena was to me was this family, uh, the, the, this community of, of family night yes. of walking dead Sunday night. You also had that. <clears throat> yes. You, you didn't have to binge it. You were seeing it in time on Sundays with mm -hmm. whomever your group was, oftentimes a family. You know, my growing up, it was uh, Sunday night was uh, Marlon Perkins and, and Walt okay. Disney. Yeah. And and Mine then it, be, it became The Walking Dead and then yeah. The Talking Dead, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's incredible. And so that did couple families. The, uh mm -hmm. You know, parents and children, right. oddly. Right. Depending on what age. You know, I, I, I always felt like, wow, that this could be a little too violent for a seven year old, but <laughs> not in some cases, I yeah. gotta tell you. Oh, he loves it. He loves it. Yeah. Does yeah. he? Yeah. Do you have nightmares? Yeah, of of <laughs> zombies. I'm like, okay, yeah. he does love it, doesn't he? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much, Lou, for being on, and thank yeah, you for the my audience. pleasure. You know, well, congratulations on the good work that you do, and, and thank continue you. to do that, and know that your audience is so thankful and grateful. We all are, and um, you know, I think you bring a service that is uh, needed, and obviously, it's working. You're coming up on a year. If you can yeah. get a year under your belt, then then you're on your way. You're like that yeah. road right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. So the road much. goes You're on forever, it. and the party never ends, right? <laughs> yes. oh, right. For your kind All right. words. All right. Uh, Good night. We'll see, you, we'll see you at the shows. God bless. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. you. Good Thank night. You. you follow me? Right on. Yes. <laughs> oh. All right. Wow, that was awesome. That was yes. Good. Man, was he can great. carry his own show. That was awesome. <laughs> he can, yes. But, you know, that's just Lou. He's fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad. Fantastic. Thank you guys for stepping around through this. Um, he is just <laughs> a fountain of information and he's such a nice yeah. guy. Yeah. So we really appreciate everybody sticking it out with us. Yeah. Anything else, ladies? Barb. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we can save it for next week, Barb. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's up to you guys. It's, if you can give, you could talk amongst yourselves for a few minutes. No, no we, we, we can. We're good. We can do it next week. Yeah, I, everybody's been around for an hour and a half now, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. See everybody later. Good night, guys. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>